thank you all so much. This is really um, an exciting gathering today. Um, a really, really important topic, and we are excited to be able to, to have this discussion with you all today. Um, I want to welcome our presenters, Dr. Wortlieb and Dr. Nasser, and you've read their biographies, but just by, by way of short biography to give us all some context, um, Dr. Wortlieb is a professor emeritus at Tufts University, and he's the coordinator for the Early Childhood Development Task Force. You'll hear more about that in the presentation. Um, he's an applied developmental scientist specializing in clinical developmental and pediatric psychology. And he brings his passion for inclusive early childhood development programming to his work. And he'll be sharing perspectives on that work today and the ways that work might intersect with refugee education more generally and more globally. Dr. Nasser is a developmental behavioral pediatrician based in London. And much of his recent work has focused on addressing the needs of children who are differently abled in refugee situations and across the developing world. He'll be sharing some of that work in those sectors with us today. Um, as well as his work with the partnership um, around early childhood development. So welcome to you both. Um, welcome to everybody participating. Thank you for being here. Thanks for making time to share your expertise and for being part of the discussion. I'm gonna turn things over to you all now, Don and Ramsey, and um, please everybody don't be shy to post in the chat, post questions, post resources, post thoughts, and we'll, we'll be discussing after the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Are you ready, Don, to take over? Mute here. There you um, go. All looking, right. Looking for the slides. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. I think the uh, the technology folks there will will get those slides put up, and people will join us as we uh, get going. Uh, I'm making the assumption now that uh, people are hearing me well enough otherwise they'll put some kind of message up in the chat box and uh, Julie will be able to attend to that uh, behind the scenes uh, but on behalf of the early childhood development task force it's a pleasure to welcome you and also want to appreciate uh, very much the partnership we are developing now with the uh, Cary Institute and Refugee Educator uh, Academy we are seizing this opportunity of really auspicious time with two global policy initiatives unfolding as we gather and our two communities recognizing shared interests and challenges. Now I'm not yet seeing the slides. So uh, the, Don, the slides are up. Are is uh, are other people seeing the slides, Julie? Yes, I can see them. Uh, Folks, are are you able to see the slides if anyone wants to unmute their mic? I can see I see the cover slide. You yes. might, can you move it to the next, do you want it to be moved to the next one, Don? No, I'm just trying, I'm concerned because I don't see the slide here. And In the I'm, chat box, we're seeing, some people are saying yes, they're seeing okay. them. No, they're not seeing them. Very good, okay. Yes, they are. So, I'm, I'm folks, make sure them. that you've got your screen open. Um, yep, and there's children's pictures up now, that's right. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, and okay. let's go to the next slide. Good. Okay, so we really are at a, a very important moment in time. Uh, and if you click uh, the slide twice now, uh, we have uh, two major policies unfolding at the international level. And the Early Childhood Development Task Force teams on nurturing care and the task team on children on the move have generated this discussion uh, and today's engagement with refugee educators who are also concerned with the particular needs of their youngest children. Uh, and it promises to be a very rewarding experience as we uh, exchange uh, our uh, perspectives. This first webinar forum gives us a chance to explore these mutual concerns and interests. Ramsey and I will take the first few minutes to sketch some dimensions of the problems and solutions and begin to pose some of the intersecting concerns and leveraging opportunities as far as understandings and skills we bring to our work in policies and programs. The nurturing care framework uh, is familiar to many of you and uh, it explicitly includes commitments to infants and toddlers with disabilities and the children on the move process winding its way through the United Nations uh, is also very explicit at this point 
in uh, invoking the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, if we can, next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, okay. If we can begin to visualize these two emerging or looming frameworks that will guide and influence our work over the next decade or so, uh, what will be some of the points of intersection? Uh, and if you click three, four times now, we will see some of these possibilities. Uh, the new policies and the protocols will emphasize an inclusive approach, uh, enacting the Sustainable Development Goals motto of leaving no one behind. So whether you're an educator in a refugee center or a health provider caring for families with young children, attention to the needs and rights of those with disabilities will be expected. These policies are going to influence our work on the front lines, as well as uh, impacts of donor government expectations and uh, the whole range of cross-sectoral uh, collaboration uh, that we'll be articulating. So we wanna use some of our time today to articulate some of the principles and some of the skills involved in this work. Next slide. As just an example of the policy context now emerging, here are a few technical words from the joint general comment approved at the UN in December and likely to be integrated in the global compacts on children on the move that are now under debate. So just reading through quickly, if you see in this particular item uh, that the committee uh, recommends that state parties put special emphasis on policies related to prevention of discriminatory practices toward migrant and refugee children with refugees and goes on to uh, ensure that the full enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms of migrant and refugee children with disabilities on an equal basis with those who are nationals of the states and then calls upon the provisions enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, we're gonna provide you with links to these documents at the end of the forum. And we anticipate that some of you may already be familiar uh, with some of these, but others may be just learning about this guidance. Uh, all of us will soon be confronting and be accountable for what these words mean when it comes down to making sure that our programs, clinics, and classrooms are made better for these children. Uh, now let me turn things over to Ramsey for a few minutes for more on the story of these children. Thank you, Don, and hello everybody and welcome to the um, uh, webinar. Um, so my, uh, uh, I think it would be uh, important now to talk about um, who these uh, children are. And uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but it's, it's probably worthwhile to review it. Um, worldwide, the WHO and others uh, estimates uh, suggest that 10 to 20 percent of children um, have some form of disability. And we'll discuss the definition of this disability in the um, um, next slide. Um, but um, in the meantime, I think we, we need to emphasize, no, sorry, go back, please. Sorry about that. Um, that the, um, there is going to be higher rates of disabilities expected among children on the move or, or migrant children for a variety of, of uh, very obvious and some less obvious reasons we can discuss later. And the numbers worldwide are quite staggering, uh, just based on some a simple number crunching from the uh, UNHCR figures from 2017 of 22.5 million refugees worldwide, with 11 million of them being children. And we can estimate just by looking at the 10 to 20 percent ratio that between 1 to 2 percent would be estimated to have a disability. And uh, with from the uh, of the 5.5 million Syrian refugees, uh, 3 million of whom are children under the eight, age of 18 years, we expect between 300 to 600,000 um, children with disability. Now, can we look at the next slide, please? So the, the definition of, of disability, I think uh, it would be wise for us to become familiar with the definition based on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, because we're looking at quite an international humanitarian context where this will probably be the most um, relevant definition. And the, uh, 
The Convention on the Rights of Disability was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2006. And the definition of disability was purposefully vague as it depends on quite a few or many factors. Um, in the description of disability, we see it as a quote, evolving concept resulting from the interaction between a person with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation in society on an equal basis uh, with others. And uh, more practically, I think it's helpful to identify some obvious cases of disabilities as included in, or as noted in the second bullet um, here on the slide. The persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various ba barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. And I think these are all words have been weighed very uh, uh, carefully to reflect this uh, broad concept. And can we go to the next slide, please? So the, uh, this slide shows some common uh, examples of disabilities, which I think are obvious to many of us who work in this field, but these include intellectual uh, disabilities, communication issues, sensory motor, and I think the last one is, is, is quite important to think about. There are many children who actually have complex disabilities with several uh, combinations uh, or comorbidities, including medical issues, some of which can be reversible and some not, such as epilepsy or degenerative diseases or multi-organ um, involvement. So shall we go to the next slide, please? Um, now I want to move to discuss uh, what we what we might call the perfect storm of displacement and disability. Perfect storm, I think, just means that two terrible things are happening at the same time. And, this, and I think this is very accurate in this case because displacement can cause new disability and worsen the consequences of pre-existing disability. Um, this can be related to physical injury, uh, disease, malnutrition, and trauma to the child and the caregivers um, of the child. And uh, we often see uh, interruption of normal um, support systems like schools and various therapies. And also importantly, many missed opportunities for interventions. And as we all know, this can have uh, many negative adverse long-term consequences that I think part of the reason we're meeting here today is that we hope somehow to work to um, ameliorate um, or prevent. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, in a somewhat uh, simplistic way, talking about how to address the needs of these children, um, as you may expect, it requires a lot of input from multiple professionals. Um, and in general, they involve three primary uh, disciplines, including healthcare, education, and social services. And often the roles of these individuals and disciplines can uh, overlap um, quite significantly. Uh, and people working, I think, with inclusive early uh, uh, or inclusive early childhood uh, development or education are very aware of this need for um, collaboration. And uh, if someone has training in special education or inclusive education or English language learning, for example, uh, you will be well aware of the uh, necessary um, teamwork. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I thought to um, bring a, a case scenario that we can use to just visualize uh, um, a real life situation. This is not actually a particularly real story, um, but it's a story that I think is quite common and one can expect will occur in, in, these, um, in these settings. So, so Omar is a three-year-old boy with autism who is nonverbal. He's, he's, uh, he does not communicate using speech and has quite limited cognitive abilities. And he left his home in, in Syria and lives in a uh, refugee uh, camp. Um, Omar suffers from epilepsy that is poorly controlled. And um, as you may expect, the circumstances of living in a crowded and an unpredictable camp environment leads to sensory um, overload, which is very common in children with autism spectrum disorders. And this manifests as aggressive behaviors because he does not know otherwise how to communicate his distress. To compound this uh, uh, difficulty is that his father is still in Syria 
And his mother is particularly uh, traumatized from a psychological perspective um, from this displacement and, and a variety of other um, uh, difficulties experienced during this uh, uh, forced displacement. Can we go to the next slide? So what are Omar's needs and, and who, can, who can provide them? Um, I think uh, from a, again, relatively simple, straightforward uh, uh, is we can think that from a health perspective, someone needs to manage the epilepsy. And in, a, in, many, kind of, in many settings uh, throughout the world, which is something we can discuss further uh, later, is that medical providers are the ones who are involved in early diagnosis of these kinds of um, uh, developmental difficulties. Or it's, it's part of a healthcare team that includes um, psychologists and um, uh, speech and language therapists. And in other settings, it might be someone in education or, or social care that might do the, uh, might make the diagnosis. But in any case, in, in this case, let's say, Omar, it's, it's a, an issue or it's, it's the task of health. Obviously, social care services need to be involved to provide, uh, might provide appropriate housing um, to uh, support his mother's mental health needs. And then education uh, would uh, uh, provide inclusive educations, uh, including uh, an appropriate school environment and interventions to improve communication, emotional support, and help manage his behavior. And I'm sure many of you um, listening in who are involved in education will have a lot of other thoughts and, and experience to, uh, of other interventions. The key thing I think we want to bring out today is how will this be operationalized and who is going to provide it and how is this going to be coordinated between these um, uh, groups. So now I'd like to go back to Don to say a bit more about the nurturing care uh, framework and then subsequently launch our discussion. Okay, thank you, Ramsey. Uh, in my role on the advisory board of the uh, WHO UNICEF Nurturing Care Initiative, uh, I look for ways to keep these matters of young children on the move in some kind of focus. Uh, more, more broadly, we're eager to uh, be sure that this new uh, policy uh, framework will be sensitive to children with disabilities. And uh, we're aware, especially as those of you who are refugee educators are aware, that uh, the particular needs of uh, those children in uh, migrant and refugee settings uh, are complicated even further. Uh, the Nurturing Care Framework for Action uh, and Results will be launched uh, at the May 2018 World Health Assembly, and we work every day to keep young children with disabilities included, uh, the many reasons for which uh, scientific, educational, economic, and moral are well elaborated in the report such as these, and you'll have uh, uh, reference material for them at the uh, end of the webinar. Uh, many of you have worked on earlier versions of related documents, and some of you may just be learning about this new and huge policy breakthrough. Uh, this week, in fact, until March 28th, a second online consultation is underway, and you're welcome to participate, uh, to voice your concerns and to contribute to your ideas. This is a rare and important this is a to uh, to uh, policies. Uh, uh, starting to get some. To get some. So uh, we're getting a little a little feedback there. Did but we did we lose Don? Nope, I'm here, but I was Perfect. getting feedback. I'll continue. I'm just urging people. Uh, the address is on the screen there. Uh, you're welcome to join the online consultation and uh, bring your notions from whatever angle of inclusive early childhood development uh, it might be. And uh, for uh, folks who are new to this, especially refugee educators, uh, the notion of participating in these uh, early childhood and health-oriented uh, initiatives, uh, it would be uh, terrific to have your inputs. Uh, so for instance, I've yet to complete the online assessment myself, but I have just read the new draft that was released for this uh, consultation, and I see some progress in addressing disability matters. In fact, there's now a box calling out humanitarian emergency issues, 
as well as one on disability matters. It may also be that the controversy of the first thousand days versus the first three years of life has been resolved, at least for the moment. Uh, the new draft uses just the three year, first three year framework and uh, the terminology first thousand days seems to have disappeared. So there can be rather dramatic changes throughout the, the draft process uh, as we get to, uh, uh, moving towards the launch in May. So let's begin this discussion. And with this next slide, let me state some goals and then I'll ask Julie to moderate our exchange. So in today's forum where we have the advantage of a, a diverse group of folks from uh, uh, a wide range of uh, disciplines and uh, different countries working at different kinds of agencies. Uh, we want to be able to hear from you whether you are a refugee educator, an early childhood development practitioner, or an advocate for young children. Uh, can we in fact identify skills and principles that guide our work, whether it's in refugee education or in nurturing care, uh, thought not just in infancy, but nurturing care as something that children need throughout uh, their lifespan, uh, and to identify some points of intersection between these domains. Uh, what have we seen or experienced as far as inspiring practices, effective curriculum, other resources that uh, we can begin to uh, collate and integrate as we move forward? And if it is the case that we need to hone our skills, uh, how might we best take the next steps in that process? So let me turn things over to Julie uh, for uh, some sense of what kinds of comments and questions are showing up in the chat box and how we might uh, uh, move into discussion of these matters. Julie. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, lots to think about. I already have a lot of my own questions that I, <laughs> I want to ask, but I, I don't want to dominate this. So if anybody wants to post a question in the chat box, um, that would be great for a discussion now. Diana, if you'll go to the next slide, I think there are a few prompts that we can um, consider broadly. Um, one more slide. Thanks, Diana. Um, so these are some questions that we can certainly start with. And we actually have um, a smaller number of participants logged on than we had anticipated. Some folks have some time differences, so we're gonna watch our video recording um, or our audio recording rather than log in. So I think we can try unmuting mics and you can ask questions directly as well. So if you have a question, you want to unmute yourself and ask that question live, you can, or if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat box, you can do that. Um, is there anyone who wants to get us started with something that's posted on the screen or something that's in your mind? Does everyone know how to unmute their audio? I have a question. Great, this, thank you, Jane. This is Jane Lucas. Um, when you focused on health, education, and social services, I noticed one of the domains that I think would be very important identified in the nurturing care framework is safety and security. I assume that children on the move with disabilities have particular needs for the environmental supports that are absolutely absent in many of the refugee camps. Uh, they can't leave their home because they can't walk in the mud uh, and so forth. So it seems to me that we need to call attention to enable uh, children on the move to be fully inclusive. We have to consider the safety, security, and environmental needs of, of these camps. Any comment from either of yeah, you? I I, uh, I absolutely agree. And I think um, in, in the sense this sort of like highlights what I mean, the, the question is, um, uh, this is a need that I think can be uh, who provides this this need we can I mean, obviously think that this is, is this the the role of um, 
this is Ramsey speaking, by the way. Is this the role of uh, child protection services or, or social services? But you can also see that it's also that a lot of health, health can contribute to this and schools by where the, 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 the schools are placed need to um, uh, need to consider this um, as well so I, I fully agree I think and it's it's a it's a responsibility across the three disciplines don't you think and organizations like UNHCR who set up these of course, of course. yes the the overarching yes of course yeah, thank you, Jane. It sounds like you're bringing up some sort of infrastructure pieces, right? Like even um, like you were talking about mud. So what are the pathways to get to school? And those are larger infrastructural questions. I think that, that to uh, elaborate a, just a bit more on Jane's point, uh, we have anecdotally, and there may even be some systematic gathering of it, but just not part of my uh, knowledge base at this point, uh, where issues of, of safety and security are actually used as an excuse for why children with disabilities are not uh, appropriately included in uh, even the, the initial kinds of early childhood development programs that are, are being established. So we want to be sure that those uh, infrastructure issues are uh, set up not only to enhance access, but also to ensure that the child's rights are uh, protected and enforced, and that uh, uh, the added safety needs that a child uh, with mobility problems or with sensory problems might have uh, do not become a reason for uh, uh, keeping them apart from the programming that's going on. I don't know if those of you who are already working in programs have uh, experienced this or any uh, notion of how common that is, but it'd be very important to stay alert to places where uh, the uh, particular uh, extra or special needs that some of these children might have uh, get used against them. Thank you, Don. Jane, thank you for posing that question. Um, does anyone else want to jump in with something related or, or another question or thought to jump off on? Uh, hi, this is Kevin in uh, Benin. Uh, we find here, uh, we're not in such a situation of uh, refugees and so on, but um, uh, you, you find a lot of kids are out of school for economic and, you know, economic reasons more than anything um, without mentioning disability. But it would seem like those groups that work to keep kids in school uh, for those reasons would also be... Uh, your, your natural allies or are naturalized in terms of uh, disability, in terms of kids with disabilities. In terms of the access uh, uh, point, uh, kids are, if they're not getting in school, well then, then they're not accessing school in the sense any kid is not accessing school is disabled from it. Um, so the, there's, inter, the, the, there's just a thought and reaction to the second point of the previous slide. Thank you, Kevin. And I noticed that in the chat box, you're, you're pointing out that poverty and economic constraints are really a, a, common, a commonality that we're seeing in terms of inclusion for refugee students, um, students with uh, different abilities, and also um, students who are, who are simply living in poverty that might not fit into either of those groups. So thank you for um, raising that. Ramsey or Dandi, is there anything yeah. you want to say? Mm. I mean, I, I think I, I fully agree with that, and I think there's just from from uh, from my experience, and and I think most people would would have seen similar things. That there's a variety of, I mean, the the barriers for kids to be um, um, in school are um, either related to sort of like infrastructure or or more uh, physical issues such as safety, for example. But then there's oftentimes in many families intrinsic issues to the families um, themselves. And sometimes they can even be as, um, uh, uh, you know, children having to go work. But the other thing that also highlights the safeguarding and the, and the child protection issue is often the issue of stigma. 
um, related to disability that still exists in many communities with um, uh, who are currently um, um, children on the move. And that's obviously by no means to uh, to generalize, but I think it's common enough in um, uh, in in many societies, and uh, compound that with the with the um, uh, lack of avail availability and the relative inconvenience of, of sending a child to the school, I think that will that's a, even makes it makes it uh, more difficult to um, uh, send the child um, to school, and that's obviously a very a lost opportunity for them. Thank you, Ramsey. I want to go back to a point that you raised earlier about um, sort of the intersection of the health and the education and the social services sectors, and we could add in sort of the infrastructure and safety pieces there. Um, are there any good models that, that you know of, Ramsey or Don, or anyone else who's on this um, webinar, models of collaboration and communication that are really working well across those sectors that could be shared? Uh, this is Don. Uh, there, there certainly are, and you'll see in the reference uh, materials that are provided uh, uh, at the end of the, the webinar, uh, uh, a good number of case examples and uh, efforts underway to describe what those uh, will be, uh, what those have been. We have the opportunity now to uh, bring that to bear on what is emerging. So uh, the kind of nurturing care uh, framework that will be evolving to, to try to integrate healthcare and early childhood development, uh, not just in refugee and migrant situations, but really across the board, and not just in low and middle income countries, but is also to speak to uh, uh, developed countries uh, as we all strive to reach the sustainable development goals, uh, different starting points, of course, but uh, expecting to make the progress. And uh, the question is whether the uh, conversation among groups such as those we have represented here can generate a picture of, well, what aspects of those things work and uh, which things do not. So uh, to, as, a, as a, just a, a gross example, when uh, the workers are siloed and the programs are, uh, are not aligned, things don't work as well as when there is some expectation and some uh, provision for collaboration. Uh, but others, I expect, uh, may be able to contribute uh, examples from their own agencies or uh, settings of uh, having seen what works, whether it's in a classroom or in a uh, refugee center. Thank you, Don and Diana. If you want to click forward to slides just to show folks, there's a long reference um, list. So those will be live links. They're in the PDF and I'll send that in the email as well. So those are some of the examples you're speaking to, Don. Um, thank you. There's a, there's, does anyone else want to weigh in on that before I jump onto a new question that's in the chat box? E examples of fruitful collaboration, communication between sectors? Okay, we'll leave that for future exploration and hopefully um, some folks on this webinar will start building some collaborative um, networks as well. Um, there's a question in the chat box that says, in many developing countries, inclusion of children with disabilities tends to focus on physical access with less attention paid to accessing the curriculum. What are some current best practices on differentiating instruction for students with disabilities in developing country contexts? Um, Don, do you want to take that or, I mean, I, I can, I can speak to my, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think where I, I previously used to work in the U.S. and I currently work in the, in the U.K. And I think the, um, uh, approach to, um, or the philosophical uh, um, approach to learning difficulties or disabilities is beyond, sort of like beyond the uh, uh, physical disability that children's more, 
you know, their, their, uh, their learning needs are heavily weighed as well as their physical access um, uh, needs. And then that translates into um, um, a relatively in-depth evaluations of what uh, a child's abilities are. And obviously the kind of evaluation is different depending on the, um, um, on the age. And, and here we're talking about the, the early years where a lot of these learning difficulties are not very well um, identified or, or, or clear. Um, and so I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering the question well, or maybe um, I can, I can clarify if you, if you want to ask a follow-up question, but it's, it's part and parcel that physical disabilities and, and learning and more cognitive disabilities are by, by design and by law are, are need to be accounted for and addressed in, in schools. I don't know if the issue in, in other places, um, I mean, could be, could be variable and it could be, and I think, I think many places have actually good laws and good policies. It's just the implementation becomes more, more um, uh, difficult. And sometimes it's much easier to identify a physical disability than a, than a learning disability in terms of the, um, uh, because the evaluations are much easier, more obvious to see it rather than the, the, uh, uh, the more learning or cognitive. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm getting the question right or if I'm on the right track in answering this. If, if the person asking this wants to clarify further, um, I'd be, uh, maybe me and Don can further um, answer. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Barbara. Um, you, you did answer the question. My interest was really to, um, to look more closely at what some of the best practices in um, allowing students with disabilities to, to access learning are. Um, and I agree with you that many times uh, physical disabilities and learning disabilities go hand in hand, although not not always. Um, and I know that there is more of a push today in developing country context to really look at um, the curriculum and how this can be inclusive of all children, including children with disabilities. Um, so you raise the issue of uh, assessing students with different needs and how uh, the assessments um, are, are usually uh, lacking or less available in developing country contexts, which then obviously makes it more difficult to uh, design a, a program that is meeting the specific needs of every student. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you are aware of any uh, developing country contexts or any in best practice in, um, in developing countries that has taken that into consideration where um, there have been um, internationally recognized assessments that have been adapted to a developing country context to assess learning, learning needs um, so that then curriculum and education program designed, designs can take those into account. So um, I thank you, Barbara. Barbara, where, where do you work? Sorry. Um, so I am based in the U.S., but um, we I oversee a program in Benin. I actually work with Kevin, who who I joined see. in earlier. Um, I, there's a there's a, so what I I mean I, I think the um, uh, Don you 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 can um, uh, chime in here for anything regarding um, uh, you know more from the um, uh, from your perspective or anything I'm missing from. Uh, uh, from a health perspective, which is obviously the, the background I, I, um, I come from, there's actually been a variety of, um, of resources and developmental assessment tools that have been um, translated or adapted or actually de novo created to assess uh, the uh, needs of children in, in developing countries. And for, for younger children, for example, um, there's a... Um, a developmental assessment tool that was developed in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, not Rwanda, in Malawi, about mm -hmm. for Malawian children. And I'm, um, uh, I, I can't sort of like 
immediately come up with the with the author, but it's it's a it's a very well known assessment uh, tool that's adapted to the Malawian and I think more generally possibly to, to other African or similar um, um, African uh, context. There have been some uh, developmental assessment or, or uh, uh, screening tools that have been translated into um, a variety of, of languages. Uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Uh, Ilya Ertem and her group in, uh, in Ankara uh, in Turkey have developed uh, a uh, developmental monitoring and assessment and intervention tool for younger children um, with to recognize uh, uh, developmental delays. Um, and that's been uh, translated into um, at least, uh, it's in Turkish, um, Spanish, um, and um, most, I think there's efforts underway to uh, translate into other languages. And I saw that Dr. Ertem actually was um, registered for the um, uh, uh, for the webinar. Uh, for the webinar. So I, I hope I'm doing it justice. And I am very glad that um, uh, Suzanne Martin Hertz just mentioned uh, it's Melissa Gladstone's work about the tool in uh, in Malawi, the Malawi Developmental Assessment, and uh, the. Um, so uh, it's right here on the uh, uh, chat, and, and uh, thank you, Suzanne. Okay, and uh, you'll, you'll also find that the, the World Bank published uh, just in the past few months a very important uh, report, uh, essentially a compendium of the uh, instruments used for assessment uh, and early learning. And uh, it may even be on our reference list. If not, it's available. Uh, in the newsletters of the Early Childhood Development Task Force. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, our colleagues at GPED uh, have released uh, a new website called disabilitymeasures.org. And the MDAT is featured on disabilitymeasures.org because these are free and uh, open source instruments. Uh, uh, now, again, unfortunately, the website is called Disability Measures, uh, but uh, especially when we're talking about young children, uh, those are also measures of development. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, uh, it, if it were up to me to change the name of the website, which it's not, I may have wanted to have uh, measurements of de uh, development as well as disability mm -hmm. implied there. So I think you'll find that those are uh, resources. And then you'll find the entire field of inclusive education uh, addresses the concerns that you're raising. And uh, uh, when you participate in the uh, nurturing care uh, survey and read the document, uh, I will wonder if you have the experience that I have is how could this whole document be written and such minimal uh, reference to the field of inclusive education when after all what we're planning to do in the first three years of life is to increase the likelihood that uh, the children will succeed in uh, education and inclusive education. So I think those, that would be the other general uh, framework there for your consideration. I hope that's helped though. Thank you, everyone. Um, there's, there's a message from Suzanne in the chat box. Um, and, oh, and she just posted the World Bank League. Thank you, Suzanne. You're making good use of our chat space. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> Please do post. We've got about 10 more minutes online here. So if you have resources and links that you want to share with the group, that would be awesome. We would love to get those. Um, Suzanne posted a, a comment and a question. She says, there are a variety of settings children on the move who have disabilities or are at risk of developing disability are located in. Um, for example, children who are currently in transit or in temporary settings compared to those who may be born into long-standing refugee settings. Are there suggestions of ways to differentiate strategies or policies in ways that support prevention as well as growth in these different settings? I think that's an excellent point. And we wanna be sure not to get uh, too narrow in our focus uh, and some of it is simply the language. Children on the move is perhaps preferable to migrant or refugee children, but uh, indeed some of the 
children that we're talking about uh, have been, uh, their families have been living in these circumstances for generations. So we do want to have uh, a, uh, a broader framework for thinking about what are the circumstances uh, across a variety of situations or venues uh, or cultural uh, uh, contexts that promote healthy development and promote healthy development of all children uh, and uh, do not take the traditional pattern of leaving out or excluding uh, those children uh, at risk for or uh, showing developmental delay or disability early on. Uh, hence the notion of the inclusive early childhood development uh, framework. I mean, I, I'm not, uh, I, and, and maybe other, uh, other people are aware of sort of like, I mean, the, the, uh, let me rephrase that. I think there are, every situation is so unique in terms of where these, we, where these children are, and there's the, the varieties of situations are so numerous. And I think oftentimes the, the solutions and the interventions that are provided are either very ad hoc or very local in the um, in the approach or divided by a variety of of, uh, of different NGOs depending on which country um, or uh, you are talking about and so I think the the most important thing that um, as a community of, of uh, people in, in multiple fields who are interested in these children is to provide and work towards a consensus that whenever anybody in any area and at any other any setting either actively on the um, in the move um, they've been settled in some refugee camp uh, for a for a certain period of time or they're actually resettled in another country that the same principles and ideas of what these children might either have been exposed to or what they what uh, what they are going through right now that all of these um, different um, uh, possibilities are explored and assessed when when thinking about what these what these children need and I think that applies for all of the sectors from infrastructure and, and overall um, uh, organizational uh, level to health social services and um, um, and education but it's it's there are some very small um, um, uh, initiative for examples uh, example that might produce results for one family or or two families in in one particular setting and I think uh, it's it's important to um, that might be difficult to generalize in different areas because the context is so is so is so different but I think the overarching big big picture concepts are the ones that need to be um, emphasized and then people can apply those locally to their um, to their context. I don't know if people agree or disagree with that. I think it's worthwhile having a discussion about that. Thank you, Ramsey. Yeah, I, you know, the complexities of the situation are what make this kind of um, sharing and discussion so important and so optimal um, because we have a variety of people in a variety of contexts online. Varun just posted a question, to what extent does early intervention contribute to inclusiveness? which is another um, important question for us to consider. We are at the end of our webinar time though, so I'm just gonna throw the, Varun, I'm gonna throw your question out there to the universe. To what extent does early intervention contribute to inclusiveness? As a K-12 educator, um, I am really excited to see what's happening around early childhood development and inclusive practices there. It certainly does influence um, the opportunities kids have at those early ages and how they move through the K-12 sector following that. So thank you for posing that question. Don and Ramsey, thank you so much for presenting today and sharing all of your expertise and everyone sharing your time. I'm going to put up a quick poll um, to get a little feedback from everybody. So before you log off, if you would please um, respond to that poll, that would be great. I'm also going to put a link in the chat box for the Cary Institute if you are interested in learning more about the work we're doing to try to bring folks together around refugee education from early childhood through adult learning. Please check that out. Um, and we're in the middle of a little fundraising campaign, so I'm gonna post that link as well. Don and Ramsey, do you have any final words that you want to, um, to share as I post the poll here? 
Uh, I will just take that my final few seconds to to uh, chime into Varun's question, uh, and that would be that if it is quality early child intervention done properly, it is actually work that is done with one of its major goals being uh, inclusion. Uh, so uh, we need to simultaneously twin track making early childhood intervention services better, uh, just as we make uh, schools more ready for a wider range of uh, children. And this is Diana speaking, and I just want to add something as we're closing up here. Um, one is to thank everybody on the call, and also to encourage you to tell us what you think a follow-up webinar or an online, a structured online discussion might be. There are some good questions that came up and we're happy to host um, a forum for people to have an exchange with one another or other ideas that you might have. Or if you're interested in presenting uh, your work, especially if it's focused on uh, pedagogical um, issues. Thank you, Diana. Ramsey, any final words you, you have for us today? No, thank you, everybody. I don't have anything extra. Okay. We really appreciate it. And again, please do be in touch. I will be following up with an email that will include the PowerPoint from today, a couple of other resources that we've uncovered, as well as notes from the chat. We have been recording this webinar, so that recording um, will just do a little cleanup in terms of audio and things, and then we'll make that available as well. And thank you everyone so much for your time today. Thank you those who are responding to the poll. If you could respond before you leave, that's great. And we wish you a great rest of the day, evening, a good night's sleep for those of you in the middle of the night. Thank you so much for logging on.